no matter how large in number a church grows, you cannot be healthy unless you do small groups well. Unless you do smaller groups well. Groups where we can know and be known. We can know others and be known by one another. That's very key and that's very vital. I'm going to share that in just a minute. There are, there are groups of all kinds. There are small groups of all kinds. Uh, uh, what kind of small groups can you think of? All of you already, already are involved in small groups, whether you, re- you really realize it or not. What small groups are you involved in? Talk to me a little bit. I'll give you one example. Your friends, your relationship that you have with your friends, that's a small group. What others? I know some of you are thinking it. Your family is a small group, right? Another, your husband-wife relationship is a small group. These are all small groups. And all of your small groups, to some degree, have a sh- contain in themselves a shadow of God. They contain in themselves a shadow of our God who is relationship in himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. So even non-Christian, fa- non-Christian friends, the friendships that you have, they are a reflection of God, though dim. And though broken, though riddled with sin and selfishness, it still is, to some degree. But Christians have been invited into a reflection of that oneness in God, the family of God, Father, Son, and Spirit, that people who don't know Him just can't know. Because this is what Jesus prayed. This is what Jesus prayed as He was facing the cross. This is the prayer that Jesus is going to accomplish, and this is the theme verse, theme verse for our ministry here at the house. This is what the house is all about. Look at this. We talk about worship, oneness, witness. It's all contained there, and I'll try to flesh that out a little bit in this message. But take a look at what it's actually saying. I in them, Jesus says, he looks at his disciples and says, I, this is what my prayer, I want to be one with these that they may be made perfectly one, and the world may know that you have said, I in them and you in me. I in them and you in me. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfectly one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. What is Jesus saying? Stay with me. This is, this is just, if, you can, if your mind can kind of approach this, it should be, you should have that emoji go boom. You know, that mind blowing emoji. I, I think it's like, like the awesomest emoji in the world. The first, when I saw that, I thought it was a smiley face with topped by popcorn, but, but it wasn't. It, it, was, <laughs> it was actually a smiley face with his head blown. And this is a head blowing kind of concept that God, the oneness that exists in God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the foundation of relationship, Jesus himself would open up the door to his house and say, come on in. Even in our, fa- in our families today, to invite somebody over to your house actually means something. It means more in certain cultures than others. But the family of God himself, God has opened it up at the cost, at the cost of his own life. His heart broken apart so that you and I might enter in. And share in the oneness. Check this out. Share in the oneness that is God himself. That's what it says here. That they may, Jesus, another place says, that they may be one just as we are one. As the Father and the Son are one. Right here it says that you have loved them just as you have loved me. Do you know that God loves you like he loves Jesus? Like he loves his only son, who by nature is one with him. He loves you, given. Do you understand that? You belong to him. He loves you, David. He loves you, Cecile. He loves you as God, as, as, as he loves his son, Jesus. When he looks at you, he sees the beauty of his son, Jesus, and loves you like he loves his son. It's the same love. It's not a different love that he has for Jesus. It's the same love. The same love of that oneness, that oneness. And because we are joined into that oneness with God through the blood of Jesus, that's what the blood of Jesus has accomplished, taking taking away every barrier so that we might be one with God, we find that we are also one with one another. That you and I are one together, are one by Jesus to be one in Him. All right? are won by his blood so that we might be one in him. So this is our reality. 
Our gospel reality, our gospel identity is that we are one with God and that we are one with one another and not any kind of weak sauce oneness, but the oneness of the creator of the universe. We are one. And because of that, all our small groups express it. And let me just continue to go on and show you how that is. 1 John chapter 1, verse, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12 have this content. By the way, who wrote the book of John? Everybody? John. John. Very good. That's a no-brainer. Right. John wrote the book of John. Right? Who wrote the letters of John? <laughs> Pastor Paul, what are you doing? Yeah, oh, okay. The letters of John are also written by John. Same author. Same author. So, the John who said that we are one with God and one with Jesus applies that oneness this way. Read with me. God is love. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Follow the logic here. God is what, everybody? Love. But this God can't be seen. He's invisible. Nobody can see him and live. But if we love one another, God abides in us, and in us, his love is perfected. The God who is love, that love is perfected when I'm loving the person in my small group. I can't see God, but when I see you loving me, when I see Mary being glad to see me, even though I haven't seen her in such a long time, and just we connect with that oneness that we have forever in Jesus, right, Mary? Yeah. When we do that, I see love, and I know that that's God's love. When I reciprocate that, or when I do that, even though it doesn't seem right, when I forgive, when it doesn't seem necessary to forgive, and I express the kind of forgiveness, the love that God has given to me, then I make the invisible God visible to somebody who needs to see him. That's how our small groups work. That's how our fellowships work. That's how in your small group of family, Elizabeth is going to show Jesus to Emma. Emma, you get to be Jesus to Elizabeth. What an awesome privilege that is. Think about that in your families to exercise this dynamic, to know who you are that you are one in Jesus with the oneness that will extend forever. That is what you are called to do. Knowing this, the church applied this, and the way the church applied it is like this. In Acts chapter 5, it's the beginning of the church, and this was their practice. Every day, read with me, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Where? Every day from the temple and from house to house, in public and also in private. Do you see this? I'm not the only one seeing this. In public and also in private, they were gathering together around God's word, learning about Jesus together. Many, many years later, you say, oh, that's, those are a bunch of Jewish people. They had their own customs, right? Wrong. The Apostle Paul, he takes this, this tradition, and when he goes out to Gentile people, non-Jewish people like you and me, he does the same thing. Look at this. He's talking about talking to elders in a Gentile, a non-Jewish city of Ephesus. And he says that I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from, everybody, house to house. So in a large group like this and from house to house. So I thought, you know, I thought maybe we should become more biblical and rename our home groups house groups. How self-serving would that be, right? <laughs> house groups, all right. Okay, that'd be cool. No, but I think home groups is good. I like the idea of home groups. Home groups, you know, it's, it's one thing to be a house, but another thing to be a home. You can look for a house, and you can want a house, but you long for a home. It takes a lot more to have a home than to have a house. You know what that means, right? All right. So you see that this is a biblical practice. 
to meet together in a larger group, public, and meet in private groups, in homes, in houses, in rooms, right? Where a few people are gathering together in twos, threes, fives, tens. So it's a biblical thing, a biblical pattern that we're trying to follow. And as we consider why we need to do these small groups, I've given you the biblical evidence, but let's, let's go after the pattern of our core values. Worship, oneness, witness. How should we do this? We do this because it fosters worship among us. When we gather together, when we worship, when you have Jesus in the center of our small groups, what are we doing? We are worshiping. We are worshiping. No matter what your small groups are, though I'm primarily talking about home groups, our church home groups today, no matter what your your, uh, small group units are, whether there's your friends that you met out at school, whether it's your family that you had no choice in choosing, right? whether it's your mom and dad or brother or sister or friend, having them become Jesus-centered, to have gospel conversations among those people, to pray with those people. That's worship. It fosters worship. Worship that cuts at the very core, to the very core of who we are, where we offer everything that we are to God. It's worship. Small groups are vital, are valuable, because it's worship when we get together. When two or more are gathered together, Jesus said, I am right there in your midst. I am with you. You have my authority. You have my presence. You have my love. It's worship. That's why small groups are so important, because when we pray together, when we share together like this, it's worship. Family. In your families, do you worship? Do you gather together with your husband and wives and those of you who are children? Do you gather together with your mom and dad? And do you read the Bible together? Do you pray together? Do you pray for each other? Do you do it? If you do do that, praise God for you. But let's say, but, but let's say you know, but that's kind of a formal thing, isn't it? And yeah, family worship at home, I think that's, that's really good. But how about even casually, do you pray with your mom and dad? Do you pray with your children? And I know some of you do, and I, I want to encourage you to do it. I want to encourage you to do it. That would, be, that would be such a strength and a help for your children and for your parents. You know, I got the opportunity to tell some people in our church, listen, this is so cool. Listen, I have a, I have a, I have, it's just one or two. No, I have a, I have two pairs of parents. One of what's, what's quite cool nice about doing this multi-generational church thing is that I get to have parents who have been evangelized by their children. I have two sets of parents in this church, in the Korean congregation, for whom I prayed with their kids about 10 years ago. (laughs) Isn't that cool? (laughs) That is cool. Come on. That is great. When they were going through their teenage years, I remember holding their hands and praying for mom and dad who don't believe, and they're coming to church right now. And they can, they can pray together. They can worship the same God together. They can look to eternity together, to being one together forever. That wasn't like that before, but it's like that now. That's, that's, that's a joy. That's a privilege that God does not give to everyone. I remember... When I was younger, I, 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 you know me, some of you, you know, I have kind of like a, you know, guys, guys, brothers, can you relate? We, we are always boys, right? No matter how old we get, we're boys at heart. And, you know, I, I did a lot of stupid things in the past, and I would probably do them, except I risk a lot more now. I have family, right? <laughs> I have family that I'm directly responsible for, that, that kind of holds me down, holds me, you know, gives me my bearings to some degree. When I was younger, I, we, we were at a, uh, we were, I was going to, I was worshiping at a church, it was three stories. I don't know who had this brilliant idea. Um, uh, some, some of the guys here have gone there with me, but we were going, we were worshiping in a three, third, three story building. They decided to put the, put the sanctuary on the third floor. And most of the members were seniors. What? Whose brilliant idea was that, right? And so eventually we did make an elevator, but it was kind of a 
an elevator on the cheap. It was barely a lift. It was a lift of a chair, right? One chair that was on a little kind of a machine. <laughs> Take one person at a time to the top, and these elders would be like in line for those chairs. It was hilarious. I think I remember trying that myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> you weren't supposed to go into the main chapel during the week. But of course, that's not going to stop me. So I snuck in there through the roof, of course. And I snuck into the main chapel, was fooling around, and I was going to get my you know, game on, just, just you know, play. But a sight saw, stopped me because I wasn't the only one doing the illegal thing. A mother had snuck into the main chapel with her kid. What a way to teach her kid young to break the rules, right? She had come in with her kid. Her kid, I don't think, was older than three years old or so. She had placed her child on the pew, right? On, this is what you call these church chairs. Placed her, there, placed her there, kneeling in front of her, just praying, just praying for her baby. If I remember correctly, I don't think the kid was sleeping. I think she was just lying there like this with her eyes shut. That's like that. And maybe she was praying with mommy as mommy was praying for her. Do you think she'll forget? Do you think that little kid will forget that prayer throughout her life? If I were her, I would not. If you were her, you would not. Loved ones, most of you are going to have children someday. Be a father, be a mother who prays. Fathers, especially you, you have been given responsibility. And mothers, if you are the only one who believes in your home, the responsibility falls to you. Lead your family in prayer. Let your family be a spiritual small group that loves Jesus like crazy. Okay? Worship in your small group. Oneness. We are here to do life together. It is in these small groups that we get to know one another and to be known by each other. I can't know you from this distance. You can't know me from this distance. I need a small group to know and to be known. All of us want to be known. There's nothing wrong with that. We are designed that way. Non-Christians want to be known. They're living in a very, very, very lonely situation. So many people seem to have so much. They have fame, they have money, they have popularity, but they are absolutely alone. And what a testimony it will be if we as a church can be the church we are called to be, a place where we are known and where we know. And in spite of the fact that we know so much about or know each other so well, we love each other like crazy. Rather, our faults and our brokenness add to the bond. Oneness. This is where we know one another and we get to know each other this is where we can practice, actually, all of the one another's of the Bible. The Bible gives us a whole bunch of one another's. It's in your small groups, in your families, in your home groups, in your friendships, that you can practice these one another's. This is what the Trinitarian love looks like when it's lived out. Look at this. See which ones you could improve on this week. Ask the Lord to give you grace to move out in these. Look at this. Accept one another. Don't just push people out of your circle. Accept one another. We're together forever. Admonish one another. Encourage each other. Pursue the building up of one another. Think of other people's benefit. Carry each other's burdens. Have equal concern for each other. Confess your sins to one another. Don't put on a face. Don't put on a mask. Confess your sins to one another. We are all broken people. Some of us are better at pretending that we're not than others. But in reality, we are all very terribly broken. So be devoted to one another. Don't give up so easily. Encourage each other. Forgive one another. Greet one another. Oh, some of us are bad at this. Why are you so bad at greeting one another? Why do you always wait until you are greeted? <laughs> what does it take? How much pride do you have to kill in order to be the first one to greet when we are already one in Jesus? Right? Just makes sense. Don't grumble against each other. Live in harmony with one another. Honor one another. Offer hospitality to one another. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. 
Be kind and compassionate to one another. Do not lie to each other. Stop passing judgment on one another. When somebody comes into this room, do not give them the evil eye. Don't do that. Right? Make them feel welcome. Let them see compassion in your eyes. I disagree with everybody that says that there was no expression in the Lion King movie. All of it was going on right, right here. Right? All of it was going on right in the eyes. That's what, it was, what the whole thing was about. Forget Lion King. You, let there be an acceptance that's felt. You have been given so much power to be accepting. When people come into this room and wonder, Do I, can, can, I, can I really belong here? Can I be safe here? Just the way you look at them can give them a yes or a no. What power God has entrusted to you Stop passing judgment on one another. Be patient, bearing with one another. Live in peace with each other. Pray for each other. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Serve one another in love. Do not slander one another. Speak to one another with songs. (laughs) Sing songs to each other. I love this. Spur one another toward love and good works. Encourage each other to keep on keeping on. Submit to one another. Teach one another. Aren't these beautiful? Aren't they challenging? They're meant to be. But this is your reality. You've been made for this. I pray that you'll live it out more and more in your small groups. And as we do that, as we reflect Jesus' likeness to each other, we will see Jesus in one another. We just read that, right? And we will grow in Jesus' likeness. That's how we were meant to grow. A lone ranger Christian is not a healthy Christian. So many people go to larger churches after they've been to a smaller church like ours. Why do they go there? Why do people, when they leave a small church, go to a larger church? There are many reasons, but... And so you might say, oh, they go to a larger church because they love people. They just want to be around a lot of people. You know, that's, that's right. You know, God's family is big. They want to be around a lot of people. You know where they go? Because they've been hurt. And really, they can't stand people. But they need to worship. They need to worship. And a larger church is a good place to hide. They can come in, participate in the worship, observe it, go home. That's it. People don't go get in their faces like they do in a small church, right? But we're not called to live that way. That's not what we are called to be. We're not just called to attend church. We're called to be church. Can I get an amen? No? Can I get an amen? We're not called to attend church, y'all. We're called to be church. And to be church, we need to exercise this oneness. It's our privilege to exercise this oneness. And it's our joy to see Jesus in one another. It's my joy to see Jesus being formed in you. And my life, myself, be changed in the light that comes from you. I think it was C.S. Lewis who is quoted as saying, when somebody you love dies, a piece of you dies too. Because that person was the only person in all the world that can bring that part out of you. I believe that's true. It's true of you. It'll be true of me. So let's practice this oneness. All these beautiful Trinitarian one another's. In all of our small groups, husbands, wives love each other. Children, parents love one another in this oneness. John, the Apostle John that was up here just a little while ago, is said that when he got too old to preach, they would wheel him in on a cart. He would say just this, little children, Love one another. And they would wheel them back. (laughs) Wheel them in. Little children love one another. They would wheel them back out. And if we practice this oneness, if we love in this way, our love will overflow. It will overflow into witness. Witness. That's what Jesus said, right? That the world may know. Not that just Christians may know, but that the world may know. When you love each other in a compelling way, when your family is in love with Jesus, people are going to see that. 
When you practice this oneness with one another, when you see each other's flaws, loved ones, when you do this oneness, you cannot help but see each other's shortcomings. But you in the church are committed to loving one another and covering each other and praying for one another and waiting for each other. In these home groups, you don't shoot people out because they're not like you. No, you hear their faults, you pray over their faults, you embrace them and you wait. And people see that and say, wait, my groups are not like that. My family is not like that. My friends won't wait for me. My friends won't have any this kind of patience with me. What's different about you? And there's your chance. I'm not different from you. I'm just as selfish as you. The only difference is Jesus. The only difference is Jesus. Can I get an amen? There's your opportunity. It leads it naturally into witness. And not only this, when you love each other this way, you want to share that. And then in your home groups, whatever your groups are, in small groups, friendships, families, and home groups at church, you can get together and do things. You can go out and be a witness. You can go to the park and sing, sing some praises and give worship to God. You can informally get together at somebody's house and read God's word and worship. And it'll bleed out into witness. It was designed to be that way. Pa- Pastor O, who's been coming Uh, once a month or so to share his heart. He's been focusing on evangelism. He says there are two types of evangelism. One is the very low-level evangelism, and the second is the higher-level evangelism. The low-level evangelism, believe it or not, is the harder one, he says, where you go out and you talk to strangers about Jesus, okay? Talk to strangers about Jesus. You know, that takes a lot of courage, a lot of boldness. It takes a lot of of a me-too strategy. Do you know what the Me Too strategy? You let somebody else do it, and you follow along saying Me Too. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's kind of how if somebody else is sharing Jesus, and you go, yeah, Me Too, amen. You know, I'm, I'm the one praying in the corner. He can talk, you know? That, that type of idea. He so said that's kind of low level. The higher level is what? You love Jesus like crazy and let people see how Jesus changes you. And when you have the opportunity, share your heart out. Yeah. That's a higher level. And here is, the, here is the other area where we can apply that, in our home groups, in our small groups, where we love each other and do relationship right, and the people will see you and say, wow, I want that. I sense I was made for it, but I don't know how to get to it. Will you help me out? I pray that there will be many testimonies of that privately as well as within this church and especially testimonies springing up from your home groups that you have, okay? Worship, oneness, witness. That is the design of the small group. That's the reason why we do small groups. That's the reason why your home groups, small groups exist. To glorify God in worship, in oneness, witness. How are we gonna do this? The home groups in the church. I'm asking you to do three things in your home groups. Now I'm speaking, this happens to me all the time. You should see it when it happens in Korean. (laughs) I can't talk. All right, anyway, uh, home groups. I want to speak specifically about the groups that that meet at 1.30 on the Lord's Day. Okay, Let me talk a little bit about logistics but I want to give you three key ingredients. When you do these home groups at church, I want you to have three key ingredients. I know that you were, some of you were given structure in the, in the past. Some of that has worked well. Not, some of them not necessarily so. Let's simplify it, and let's have at least these three ingredients in the small groups, whether it's the young adult small groups or the couple small groups or the, or the youth small groups. Have these three ingredients. One, Share these three things. Share the mess from the message, share from your life, and share a prayer. These three things. The message, life, and prayer. Very simple. Very, very simple. Everybody can do it, and anybody even can lead it. These three things. One, share from the message. Share what you have learned. Share what you've been blessed by through the, the, the message that was given on that Lord's Day. Good? What if, Pastor Paul, this home group moves out of the Lord's Day during, during the week? Even better, you have a midweek reminder of what the Lord said to you on the Lord's Day. Right? Right? Okay. 
Pastor Paul, what if I wasn't blessed through the message? Ah, good. There's an opportunity. Pastor Paul, I was so tired, I slept through the message. Ah, there's the opportunity. Then somebody else who didn't sleep can encourage you saying, Pastor Paul said this, that, and the other, and it was such an encouragement to me. See, this is this share from the message. It's not a time where you critique Pastor Paul's sermon, okay? That's not what it's about. And somebody may say something like this, man, Pastor Paul, his English was terrible today. His grammar was just, I don't know when he came to America, but it was really bad. He was so fobbish. Some, somebody can say that. You're not supposed to do that. You can, you're not supposed to use that time for that. But then you can redeem the message I messed up by saying, but that part in the sermon where Pastor Paul said that we are to cover one another's shortcomings, wasn't that good? <laughs> Can't we put that into practice, starting with our pastor? Right? Right? Do you, do you not see this? Even if, look, I love you, but sometimes the sermon does not go where I want it to go. Sometimes I prepare, sometimes I prepare all night. And I'm up to here in the message that I want to bring. And I'm so eager, eager for you to get it. But my eagerness gets in the way and my exhaustion stops me. And I listen to the sermon and it tanks. Okay? I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I'm not very happy with how I preach. If the preacher's not happy with his preaching, I understand it when sometimes you're not. I understand it. But then in these small groups... You can encourage one another because I guarantee you this. I may miss on many other points, but I'm going to preach to you from God's word. And so God's word will not go empty. So you have an opportunity then to take God's word and apply it to your brother's and sister's heart that didn't get done during the message time. Right? Share from the message. And share your life. Share your life in these small groups. Open your heart. I know that some of you is going to take a long time, especially Asian cultures. We're so easily closed off. I, I know it's easy to blame teenagers and your hormones for being closed off, but Asian cultures, you've got a, a double whammy. You're Asian on top of it, okay? So it's easy to be closed. I understand it. But as a church, as a family of God, we are called to be open. And let's open our hearts with one another. Let's find that safe place in these small groups to share life with one another and also share prayer then. There's no better way to share life than to share prayer and to pray for one another in your times of need and your times of joy. Prayer and praise, these three ingredients. Okay. I don't think I need to explain too much more about this, but you know, I remember being at a retreat. I remember one time I said to the staff that tonight we're going to pray with our students. I kid you not, I looked around at the staff, I got this blank expression all across the board. It turns out they've never prayed with their kids. What, what in the world, right? And so we had to learn all over again to pray with the people that we are called to serve. Practice here. Practice where it's safe in these small groups home groups, and then maybe the Lord will lead you out into pray, to praying in a larger group like this, depending fully on the Lord. Okay? Pray, let it be prayer. It's a place where you share from the message, share from your life, and share prayer with each other. Oh, I'm looking forward to hearing good fruit coming from this. And then there are other details that I put in your sermon overview sheets. You can look on them, when th th these things should happen, how often. Please just be flexible. Make up also how many people in each group. I think about 10 is probably ideal. You can't have a 100 member small group, okay? Oh, my group is so good and we're so growing and people are evangelizing. How big is your group? A 100 is not a small group anymore. Let it grow, maybe over 10, maybe up to 20, but let's, and then we split off, right? Within the group. And what a wonderful place to invite people who really wonder if they fit in and say, hey, come on, be, and you're inviting, and be an inviting home group and bring them in and let them taste the fellowship that is uniquely yours of what Jesus has given to you. By the way, one word of caution. Don't do your home group forever, okay? The one that we do at church don't do your home group forever. 
loved ones, some of you are verbose, all right? As a pastor, let me say, as a person who, 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 whose life is about, you know, using language, some of you have a lot to say. I know, I know. Don't you know, use up all the time. Be concise, precise. If you're leading, make sure the time is managed well. Don't be offended if you get cut off, right? It's like, I'm never going to talk again. They cut me off. Well, how long were you talking? 20 minutes. No, okay. No, I, that was, that was your, your problem. 20 minutes. They have an hour. That just kind of, you know. So just be wise. Be loving. And then if you need more time, you can also, of course, always take it outside of church. Right? Just, I would just love it for this home groups to take, lives of their, take on lives of their own. And you take it out of here to the cafes. You take it out of here to different places. Heck, there's a church that, like, right up the street, much, much bigger than ours. It looks like an airport, okay? And they have a cafe inside of it. Meet up at that cafe once a week. Oh, you don't want a long-term commitment? Okay, do it for about six months. Once a week, you go up there and just read the Bible together and pray together. You find somebody that you can click really well with? Do it. Why not? Right? Whatever it takes. Let's love one another. Let's do small groups well. And the only way we can do a large group well is if we do small groups well. Just practically speaking, it's biblical. Let's glorify him in every small group that God has providentially placed you in.